Good afternoon. Um, welcome to our Dignitas workshop on workers' rights. I uh, ask you to sign in, please, so we have a record of the folks that are attending. This, as you know by now, is being recorded, so this workshop will be on um, the website as soon as, as possible. Um, so we'll start with a prayer, and then I'll just turn it over to Deacon Omar. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Good and gracious God, we thank you for bringing us together. We ask you to make us mindful of your call to be merciful, to forgive. We ask you to reach out, help us reach out to those who are less fortunate and help us in this presentation understand the importance of equity and righteousness in workers' rights. We ask all these things through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Ah. So this is fair trade coffee. So if you, if you don't have a cup of fair trade coffee, it's out in the back. So please be sure to get yourself some fair trade coffee. And it's quite delicious. And it just rolls against the tongue. Very, uh, it it's, it's, has these beautiful uh, light uh, flavors. And uh, it's, just, it's, it's just pleasing to the soul whenever you drink it. So I invite you to have a cup of fair trade coffee with us. So many of us drink coffee at home. We drink coffee at our workplaces. We even drink coffee in parish life activities. And coffee is, in the United States, the largest import and the world's second most valuable traded commodity. So which is the first commodity? Oil. So we have oil and then coffee, right? Second most valuable traded commodity in the world. And there's approximately 25 million farmers and coffee workers in more than 50 countries involved in producing coffee. And coffee producers are unfortunately they are kept in a cycle of poverty and, and debt by the current global economy, which exploits cheap labor and keeps consumer prices low. So, empathy, my brothers and sisters, is the key to understanding the plight of the worker. And that's what my talk is today about. It's, it's to understand the plight of the worker through the eyes of a coffee worker working out on the coffee fields. So I'd like you to take a moment to think about nothing else except what I'm going to share with you, to perhaps imagine yourself in this particular scenario. These scenarios I'm going to present to you, they come from dailycoffeenews.com, real scenarios. So let's say you you are in the coffee fields. It's harvest season in Nicaragua, so you and your family have gone to live on the coffee farm for the season. You share one large room with up to 60 other farm workers and their families as well. You have no privacy. There is not enough mattresses or blankets for everyone. There are only a few latrines, so sometimes you have to relieve yourself in the coffee field instead of using a bathroom. Sometimes you have to bathe in the river. You face unsafe conditions in the field each day. Since you typically aren't provided any gear, you bring your own rain boots, you use trash bags to serve as ponchos, and you bring a machete for protection. You face creatures like snakes, large spiders, and fire ants all over the fields. And you are required to apply pesticides to plants, which is obviously a health hazard to you and to your family and to your fellow workers. You apply this pesticide without any personal protection for yourself. You work long hours each day throughout the harvest season, but you have no control in terms of how much you're going to be paid. 
Even though the minimum wage in Nicaragua is actually $6, that is the legal minimum wage, $6 a day, you might as well be making as little as two to three dollars and without a contract, which you don't have, there's really nothing you can do about it. And you're also worried about your children. You see your children, they work in the fields with you. You need their help because you will not receive your wages if you do not make the day's quota, which is typically around a hundred pounds a cup of coffee. That's what you need to collect in one day. And your children are there to help you make that quota, but they are not paid separately. Of course, they also face uh, the many violations, many violations of their human rights. Again, these scenarios brought to you from Daily Coffee News. So, what do you think? What were your feelings as you put yourself in the shoes of a farm worker in Central America? You know, right now we keep hearing about the news of the migrants coming in, you know, the, the, the caravans coming in. And many of them have their own stories as to why they want to come in to our country. But the reality is, many of them live in poverty. And, and these scenarios that I brought to you, this is very typical of the lifestyle that these people live. And me being a Global Fellows with Catholic Relief Services, it gives me the opportunity to be able to share their story, to be able to share their plight with all of you, and to be able to get us to think to, be get, to get us to reflect on what we can do, on what our faith calls us as disciples of Christ, to be able to, to do something, to do something. Opening the borders may not necessarily be the right answer. Who knows? I don't know. I'm not a politician. But I do know this, that we are called to go out and help them within their own communities. And if we go out and help them within their own communities, then we may not, be, we may not, not see these type of uh, migrants coming in the caravans out to our borders. Why? Because they would be able to provide for themselves. They would have a life that's sustainable for themselves where they are at. And that's what Catholic Relief Services does. We go out to meet them where they are at. So what issues surfaced? in the scenarios that the farm workers typically faced. So you got poor housing, poor working conditions, you have lack of contracts, you have low wages, and, and believe it or not, we also have the effects of climate change too happening on their livelihoods, and of course, we have child labor. So, how does our Catholic faith call us to address these issues? What beliefs or themes in, from our Catholic tradition, or the stories from Scripture, compel us to honor the dignity of the workers around the world. And that's what this talk is about. Honoring the dignity of work around the world. Pope Francis, he tells us that we are a globalized world, and we obviously know that. And he says that this globalized world that, we, uh, that we're in, it's led to a globalization of indifference, where we are connected so much to each other around the world that we get to the point where, yes, we hear the plight of the suffering around the world, but we're at that point in our lives where we say to ourselves, what can I do? There's really not much I can do, and we let it go. And for most of us, we let it go because we really have no idea of what to do. And then we have organizations, the agency of the U.S. Catholic bishops, Catholic Relief Services, where we call out people and say, yes, we can do something. And one thing that we can do is taking a look at fair trade products and buying and purchasing ethically traded products. Because when we do that, we actually help to contribute to the dignity of work. 
we actually help contribute to those who are living in poverty and working in poor uh, conditions. So today is about reflecting on the lives of the low-wage workers in other countries and what our faith compels us to do. So sometimes we look to Scripture to give us the answers. Okay? And the particular theme that I want us to focus on is on connectedness. And so I made some copies of some scriptures. And these are all very popular scripture passages for us. But I'd like us to start thinking uh, through the eyes of how we are connected throughout the world. Thanks, Jim. So we take a look at uh, from St. Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 12, 14 through 26. And what I'd like us to do, as I read this piece of Scripture, I'd like us all to kind of get involved and put our own thoughts into it as well. Any word or phrase, kind of like Lexio Divina, right? Any word or phrase that stands out to you, that touches your heart, please underline it. Uh, uh, make a little note of it right there on the handout. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, because I am not a hand, I am not a part of the body. It is not for this reason any the less a part of the body. And if the ear says, because I am not an eye, I am not a part of the body. It is not for this reason any the less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now... God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he desired. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now, there are many members, but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body which seems to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor. And our less presentable members become much more presentable. Whereas our more presentable members have no need of it. But God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacked, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. So I'd like to open it up to you. How does the word speak to you? What phrase or word gravitates to your heart, tugs at you, especially in regards to what I'm trying to share with you? today. <laughs> the first phrase and the last, you just put those together. For if the body is not one member but many, and if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. That's right. What else? In the context of fair trade, our less presentable members become much more presentable. That's right. 
or less presentable members become much more presentable in regards to fair trade, exactly. And like Deacon Peter was saying, if we do something, if we do our share in helping those around the world, then my theory is really, we won't be seeing caravans of this nature trying to wanting to cross into the United States. I just don't see it. If we do our part in helping others where they're at. In other words, they are members of this one family, the human family, and if other members help out this members of the human family, well, I think they're going to be happy where they're at. I really do. Our interconnectedness, like for example, we're so connected besides drinking coffee like we're doing now, the clothes that we wear as well. A lot of the clothes made, I'm sure you've seen labels made in Bangladesh. And so and all, we've heard the plight of the garment workers in Bangladesh making for a number of years $68 a month. And just this past year, again, because people are beginning to raise their voice, because even the workers are beginning to unite as one, just last year, they ended up getting a pay increase to about $192 a month. And, and uh, they've gotten brands like Levi's and retailers like Walmart to be able to sign to be able to sign a contract saying that they will be paying their garment workers uh, a lot more a fair wage than what they were doing in previous years. So things are happening. So we'll find out what's uh, in, in this year, 2019, what's going to happen with the garment workers and to see if their new laws uh, are coming into play. So, but again, being all interconnected in terms of the clothes we buy, uh, the, the gifts that we buy for one another, the jewelry that we buy as well for one another too. Uh, we, we take a look at the mine workers who, uh, who minded the, the diamonds, right? And, and their plight and their story. The food that we consume and their plight and their story. I mean, there's so many things that we purchase that affects other people. Even in China, I don't know if it's still happening. This I heard was quite a few years ago, and it might still be, but on skyscrapers, they actually have nets around skyscrapers, and you can look it up. They have nets around skyscrapers because the suicide rate is so incredibly high, people jumping off the skyscrapers. And why are they doing that? Why are people killing themselves like that? One reason? The low wages that they earn. There's no dignity in the work that they do. Now why does our church call us to care for others? And that's where we take a look at the second piece of scripture. From the book of Genesis, chapter 1, 26 through 31. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth and of every tree which has fruit yielding seed. It shall be food for you. 
and to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth, which has life. I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. So here, my brothers and sisters, here's where we get the essence of the dignity of work, one of our social teachings, right? Our Catholic social teachings. The dignity of work and the rights of workers. Here in this passage, we get the essence of our number one social teaching, uh, which is the dignity of human life, which is the purpose of our gathering today. Uh, which is in everything that we do. It all goes back to the dignity of human life. Why do we have dignity? Because we are created in the image and likeness of God. And because we are created in the image and likeness of God, inherently we are born with that dignity automatically. And here in Scripture, God is giving us the world to take dominion over it, to take power over it, to use it to help us. And hence, we have the dignity of work. And work is to be dignified around the world. Work is not there to be able to subdue us. In fact, we are called to co-create and to be co-creators of this world, to take care of this world, just like God is taking care of this world. We are called to participate, to cultivate it, to make it better for future generations, as God has given us that gift to do so. So we are called to do just that. And that's what makes uh, the dignity of work a Catholic social teaching, and one that we really need to reflect on. So, there's a little video that I'd like us to, uh, I'd like to share with you. Catholic Social Teaching 101, Dignity of Work and Rights of Workers. For us as believers, the dignity of work comes out of a whole theology of creation. In Genesis we see that God has made creation and entrusted to us the continuation of His work. Work is God's gift to us. We're able to use the different gifts that God has given us, physical gifts, spiritual, mental gifts, to make the world a better place. Because the church recognizes that every person is created in God's image and likeness and therefore has inherent dignity, we also recognize that work exists for people. People don't exist for work. So recognizing the rights of workers is one of the ways that we honor the dignity of every person. Among the things that we need to uphold are the, the just wage, the safe working conditions, and the possibility of the worker to participate in the fruits of his labor. Catholic teaching holds that workers have the right to dignified work as well as to time for leisure and rest, and they have the right to benefits such as sick leave and maternity leave and paternity leave and health care. Workers have a right to adequate support in their retirement and also to choose to form unions if that's what they like to do. Catholic teaching also holds that workers have responsibilities. They have the responsibility to provide a fair day's work for a fair day's wage. Managers and supervisors and employers can make decisions in their workplaces that uphold the rights of workers, that provide decent wages and a safe working environment. We have situations here, right in here in our neighborhood, where we've seen people that were not employable. And the best thing is when they can get back on their feet with the help of, of church and our diocesan programs that will help them find a job with meaning. All of a sudden the neighborhood gets better, they feel great about themselves, and there's a harmony that's created that uh, really shows the dignity of work. 
Sometimes it can be easy to forget the workers who are involved in producing the goods that we consume, so it can be helpful to think back. If you take a cup of coffee, thinking all the way back through the roasters and to the farmers who actually grew the beans, there are many workers in that process, and our decisions impact them. It's important that our people be informed about the different issues around work in our society and try to promote just laws and uh, talk to people about the uh, importance of respecting workers' rights. As consumers, we need to be aware that really every purchasing decision is a moral decision. We can purchase ethically produced products or fair trade products. We can purchase locally and support local farmers, for example. All Catholics need to be aware that this is a part of the way that we live our life of discipleship by promoting uh, human dignity, uh, defending the workers' rights, and looking for ways to make our society more attentive to the needs of those who are most vulnerable. So as we saw in the video, there are many ways that we are obviously connected to the different types of workers around our world. Again, by the clothes that we wear, the food that we eat, cars that we drive, the gifts we receive. Coffee is just one particular element. So I'd like us to see how, uh, just to get a little bit of, uh, a little bit of a sample of the coffee chain, all right, the coffee supply chain. You'll notice I put some cups right here of, the, of our coffee beans, right? And, and I need some volunteers, okay? So uh, please don't all volunteer at the same time, you know, because, you know, okay? So here we go. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Oops. Oops, there you go. Okay. There you go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there you go. Mm -hmm. oh. All right. Maurice. You're in it now, Mike. All right. Take one. All right, Daryl. There you go. Okay. So. Now, there's, this is the conventional coffee chain. It's done all over the world. And there's nothing wrong with this conventional method of doing business. We do it even in manufacturing. But people definitely get affected by it. And, and you're going you're gonna to see that. So, we begin with number one. Okay, uh, number one, the farmer. All right, so who's number one? Okay, so please, number one, farmer, if you can stand up right here. Okay, and go ahead and read to us your situation. Here's where it begins. I'm the farmer. I grow the coffee plants. I spend endless hours fertilizing, pruning, and caring for them. I live in an I live in an isolated and mountainous region of El Salvador with my spouse and five children. I have no electricity, no ability to stay on top of current mar coffee market values. <coughs> I have to live all year on what I can earn from my annual harvest. Although life is difficult, I am a faithful person and even built a small chapel on my land for community worship. After I harvest the coffee cherries, they are sold to my buyer. Okay, so here's your cup. Okay, that's what you're left with. All right, so number two. Okay, no, no, just stand up here. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so just go that way. All right, number two, please. Who are you? I am the buyer. I come to the farmers and buy their coffee. 
I have a truck to transport the coffee which the farmer does not have. I have enough cash to buy the coffee. Last year I gave the farmer a small loan last growing season so he could feed his family and he is now indebted to me. So I had to buy the coffee well below market value to compensate for the money, including interest, the farmer owes me. I will take the coffee cherries to the processor. Okay. So here's your piece of the pie. Okay, number three. Who are you? Um, I am the coffee processor. I am the coffee processor. I have an industrial plant with heavy equipment and machinery which allows me to pass the cherries through a pulping machine to remove the outer flesh. I dry, sort, and package the beans. I then sell the packaged coffee beans to the exporter. Okay. Here's your piece of the pie. Okay, number four. I'm an exporter with my country of origin being El Salvador. I do the legal documentation and after the paperwork has been completed, the coffee beans are sold to the importer. Okay. And you're a piece of the pie. Number five. Okay, I am the importer based in the United States. I process the paperwork on this end. After the paperwork has been approved, the coffee beans are sold to the roaster. Okay, and that's your piece of the pie. Number six. I am the roaster, also a U.S.-based company. I have a processing plant with large coffee, coffee roasters. After roasting the coffee, I sell it to a distributor. Well, that's your piece of the pie. Number seven. one of many distributors. I give the bean its brand. I compete against many brands. I package, promote, market, and distribute the coffee beans to retailers. That's your piece of the pie. Thank you. And number eight. Okay. Watch your step there with the cable. Yeah, you got that right. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. And you are? The real tailor. I am a retailer. This distributor stocks my shelves at my grocery store. They come to my cafes and restaurants that sell the coffee to you, the consumer. And here's your piece of the pie. All right, so as you can see, the coffee chain solution from farmer all the way to retailer, the farmer is left literally with crumbs, practically nothing. The farmer, more than likely, would end up with about 50 cents for a pound of coffee. 50 cents for one pound of coffee, all right? Versus all the way for in a 12 bag, I mean, uh, for a $12 typical bag of one pound coffee, the retailer ends up with the most. So everyone gets a piece of the pie. This is a normal standard supply chain. We see it all the time. That's how business works. Our Catholic faith, on the other hand, is challenging us and encouraging us to think of new possible ways of doing business where things could be a little bit more fair, uh, uh, ethical, you could say, in terms of how we should treat the farmer who is absolutely left in poverty. So if you could please all take your seats, and if you could put all the cups down right here.
So if I could have my two volunteers come up here. <laughs> so now, who are you? I'm the farmer cooperative. Farmer cooperative, and you are? I'm the coffee company slash roaster. Okay, so farmer cooperative. So this is what fair trade is all about. Go ahead. I am in I, the farmer cooperative. I am in a group of farmers pulling together the volume of what you grow. We are called a cooperative. As a cooperative, we can negotiate better prices and trade directly with coffee companies. We give a portion of every pound sold to community development projects run by the cooperative, such as schools, roads, or credit unions. We sell our coffee to a company, to a coffee company or roaster. And you are? I'm the coffee company slash roaster. I am a mission-driven coffee company slash roaster. I build direct relationships with farmers and visit the farmers each year. I only buy from cooperatives of small-scale farmers, not from big plantations. Unlike many big players, I pay a fair price for every pound of coffee that I buy from farmers. So here's your share of the pie. So we went from one model of doing business to another model of doing business. Yes, we do. We cut out the middleman intensely. We do do that. But look what happens here. The person working in the fields, they actually get a better wage now. They're actually able to sustain their lifestyle. They're able to provide for their families. And not only that, they form what's called a cooperative. In other words, they get together with other small farmers in the community. They pull their resources together to form like one large company, which we see here in the United States happening all the time. Small business coming together to form a larger, stronger company. That's what's being done there. But they not only provide for themselves, but they also help the immediate community as well. So you see other small businesses developing because of the cooperative that's being developed. And so a fair trade roaster comes into the area. He, his mission is to buy from these cooperatives. That's his task. And he has the resources, instead of using all these different organizations to get the coffee across to the, uh, to the consumer, he is able to keep everything in-house. And because he's able to keep everything in-house, he's able to sell directly to the consumer. So profit is made for both companies. Everyone's happy. Yes, maybe the middlemen, they're not happy about it, but it's okay. Their job is to go ahead and find dignified work for themselves, uh, too. So thank you, volunteers. Okay, so here we go. Catholic Relief Services, what it, what it does is it actually helps. It helps to form those cooperatives, too. So it, it, it's not only there to, to do education and to help uh, financially, but it's, they're there to also help to form communities uh, to be, for these communities to be sustainable. So that's what it's about. Here's another little video on ethical trade. Equal Exchange was started to build supply chains that work for small farmers, to make enough money so that they can stay where they live and cultivate products in a healthy way and one that respects the planet, putting heart and soul and sweat into the best products they can make. Produciendo el cacao, me siento bien. ¿Eh? Uno, contribuyo al desarrollo del país. Dos, aumenta mi producción económica. Tres, 
Muy bien. Ya este está listo para el chocolate. The people who make our products possible, going and spending time with them in their homes, on their farms. I get to sit down with the cooperatives that we work with and say, you have a blank slate. What are the projects you've dreamed of that will help your cooperative to grow and to innovate? And how can we help you to do that? Vienen aquí personas de Igualichén a compartir con productores y con el equipo técnico. Entonces es como una hermandad. Nos ha ayudado a mejorar eh, los procesos en términos de, de calidad. Eso garantiza la sostenibilidad en, en el tiempo. What does equal change mean to me? It means Fátima in Nicaragua. It means Angélica in Colombia. It means all of the farmers struggling and fighting. And equal exchange means the, the world to me, from the point of origin through to the finished product. I always think of the farmers when I go back to my desk in the U.S. and I want to talk about the care and expertise that goes into the products and the change that can be built over time when you support equal exchange. I know these people, I'm fighting for these people, I'm out in the market, um, you know, trying to tell their story. Lo que ellos están pagando un poquito más por el producto de comercio justo tiene real efecto positivo llegando principalmente al productor. You're the ones who make this whole experiment work, and you're the ones through your purchases who are demonstrating that this is a viable way to run a business. You can take a stance with your purchases, and that's really powerful. <laughs> so that's what fair trade is is all about helping the uh, the weakest the weakest member of the uh, of the supply chain. So I have a handout here too on what is fair trade. Yeah, we guess we can wait. A, okay. Yeah. So what is fair trade? Fair trade is one model of ethical trade. It embodies a comprehensive set of criteria, including at minimum the following commitments. So here's what I really like to focus on on these bullet points. Paying a fair wage in the local context. Offering employees opportunities for advancement. Providing equal employment opportunities for all people, particularly the most disadvantaged. Engaging in environmentally sustainable practices. Being open to public accountability. Building long-term trade relationships. Providing healthy and safe working conditions within the local context. And providing financial and technical assistance to producers wherever possible. So that's the criteria for fair trade. So, and it makes sense. And we, as disciples of Jesus Christ, also as consumers within the United States, we have an opportunity to help these people. We may not be able to do a lot, but we can certainly help uh, contribute uh, to their well-being by taking a look at ethically trade, uh, traded products. And one thing that I want you to get in the habit of from now on as you go into the malls, as you go to Walmart, Target, the grocery stores, Stater Brothers, wherever you go to, is get into that habit of actually looking at the labels, looking to see if they have a fair trade label. And these are various labels right here. Um, so you can see for yourselves. 
Okay, you can take one of each. Okay. So again, that handout, it just, uh, if you get a chance to read it over, it just be helps you to become a little more sensitive as to the labels on the products that you purchase. So for example, on this Mama Tierra uh, coffee, okay, it's, it's from the Equal Exchange, so you will see the label right there, Fair Trade Coffee, okay. Uh, this, making this purchase, it's a $12 bag, okay, so the price is comparable to, to many other coffee brands out there. But the nice part about this coffee is we know where our funds go. Okay, so we know where the money goes to uh, and that makes it a beautiful thing because we know it helps those cooperatives, those farming communities uh, out there uh, that are actually producing the coffee bean for us. So, okay, and you also had an opportunity to taste this Mama Tierra uh, brand of coffee. So if you like it, please definitely help them out, make a purchase. I have some flyers here on it. And this coffee comes to us directly from Mexico. And on the back, there's a website link to it. That's it. Thank you. So what I'd like to do is ask you a question in terms of how would you describe fair trade to someone else? So how would you describe it? How would you describe fair trade to someone else? If you were asked that question, what is fair trade? What can you tell me about it? Giving everybody an opportunity to succeed. Giving everyone an opportunity to succeed. How, how would you describe it? Anyone else? Well, equitable, equitable from beginning to end of whatever process is involved so that people are afforded the opportunity to meet the share in the success of whatever is involved. There you go. Good. All right. For me, it would be protecting, again, the, the farmer, the, the, the producing denomination in the um, system. The most disadvantaged. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Another video. This video, I like this video because it kind of encompasses everything that we do at, for CRS. Food, water, a safe place to call home. No matter who we are or where we live, there are basic needs that we all share. We have a right to the things we need to live our lives to the fullest. And if we have a right to these things, then we have a responsibility to make sure others have access to these important things too. In fact, it's part of our Catholic faith. St. John the 23rd wrote, to claim one's rights and ignore one's duties is like building a house with one hand and tearing it down with the other. St. John the 23rd is reminding us that we're all part of one human family and that we're responsible for one another. It's our job to make sure we each have what we need to live the lives God calls us to. Meet Kumba. She lives in a small town in the north of Sierra Leone. She's 12 years old and in the fifth grade. She works hard to help her family through chores and through her studies. In Sierra Leone, students like Kumba are exercising their rights and responsibilities by going to school. Ensuring that young people receive their right to a good education is essential to the future of Sierra Leone. For Kumba, it isn't enough to simply receive a good education. She wants to do more. She wants to help her community. The 
School is important because when I grow up, I want to be a nurse. In a country that's still recovering from a brutal civil war and a recent outbreak of Ebola, young people like Kumba will play a big role in rebuilding their nation. Nurses treat people in hospitals, like during the Ebola crisis. Nurses help sick people get better. Because education is a right we believe all children should enjoy, CRS is working to ensure that students come to school and stay in school. To accomplish this, CRS gives a free lunch to students in schools across Sierra Leone. That's 32,000 children a day. These lunches mean that students can focus on their studies and not on their hunger. Through the Food for Education program, we really have an opportunity to respond or to act uh, in accordance with the Catholic social principles and help students we work with to understand that they have a responsibility not only to uh, their society, not only to their families or their communities, but to the nation as, uh, at large. We can learn a lot from young women like Kumba. Our rights, including education, are not to be taken for granted. We have a responsibility to ensure that everyone receives a good education, and we have a right to use what we've learned for the common good of our human family. Learn more at crsricebowl.org. So if you noticed, it was from the McGovern Dole Initiative. So back in October, I don't know if you know, I went to Washington, D.C., and my job was to go ahead and lobby uh, on behalf of this particular program that you see right here on this video to provide humanitarian aid. So when uh, Congress, or they all get together, they have to vote on what they're going to do with humanitarian aid or whether we're going to give humanitarian aid around the world or not. And it's really just less than 1%. Well, that less than 1% is a lot of money in our, from our federal, uh, our federal uh, budget. And so my, my role, along with other global fellows, uh, and these were global fellows from pretty much all over the United States, a bunch of deacon, deacons and priests, uh, where we went to Washington, D.C., and we spoke to our, our senators, and we spoke to our Congress uh, men and women as well. And pushing for this type of humanitarian aid effort. And so that's exactly what you see there, is this lunch program that's actually given to the, uh, to the poor communities uh, around the world. So, so good things are being done. So, so that's it. I can't provide all the answers, um, but I just merely want us to reflect on uh, what we can do, how we can contribute, and not fall into this trap of, of being this global indifference inside of us. Obviously, we can do something, and we can participate by next time we purchase things, you know, purchase locally, and of course, uh, the things that we do buy, purchase ethically traded uh, products, which will certainly help out those who are most disadvantaged. I have here some chocolate that I'd like to share with you. So this is equal again equal exchange uh, candy bars okay okay and and like all good things what I like to do is I want all of you to break open a piece with me I, I like to break chocolate with you to, today okay all right so here we go so, how sweet how sweet all right so all right, all right. So that way we can all have a little taste of equal exchange chocolate. All right? So, yeah. All right? So save the wrapper, right, in case you want to buy some more. You know, so, so right, so it says we need you. So there you see the back of the wrapper, right, who it benefits. And again, it benefits the farmer who picks, who picks the, the, the cocoa beans for us, right? So let's see how this tastes. Okay, there's more information on the inside of the wrapper as well. Okay, and uh, let's see how this uh, equal exchange chocolate tastes like. So if I can only open it, ah, there we go. All right. So everyone have, everyone have. Cheers. Salut. 
Mmm. Quite delicious. So there you go, everyone. That's my presentation. Thank you, everyone.